I just came back from the Mars 2020 landing site meeting and we presented the case for where to land the rover. It's a 1,600 pound rover uh, on Mars in two and a half years uh, to go and look for evidence that life might have been at the surface of Mars. And uh, they're taking our advice, so that's, that's pretty good. Uh, so Charles Darwin thought that life started in uh, a warm little pond somewhere, and he actually got it right. He got the idea of the ammonia, phosphoric salts, etc. Uh, but he also has a statement right at the end of this letter to his friend J.D. Hooker that a protein compound was chemically formed ready to undergo still more complex changes. He nailed it in 1871. You need something called away from equilibrium chemistry, which takes something short and gets it longer and longer, like the picture on my phone. So the field went through multiple phases, the, the so-called primordial soup phase of the 1920s through 1950s, Miller-Urey and that famous spark chamber experiment that's in every single scientific horror film, right? That <laughs> <laughs> and they made uh, amino acids from basic atmospheric components that launched our field. In the 70s, these deep hydrothermal vents were found in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and for years, people believed that life might have started there. The geochemists loved it. The regular prebiotic chemists always hated it because you can't actually make the chemistry work in an aqueous medium. So the field was sort of left hanging uh, until I met Dave Diemer in 2009, and we came up with a new hypothesis. At the same time as I met Dave, at UC Santa Cruz, and a fantastic discovery was made in Australia of the oldest, clearest, richest evidence for life on Earth in a preserved ancient hot spring on, Mar on Mars in the Pilbara in northwestern Australia, uh, in preserved in geyserite, which can only be made with a geyser comes and splashes on the surface. So as those colleagues were discovering the geyserite, we were developing our full hypothesis. It's happening at the same time. This is some stromatolite that I found in about three years ago in the Pilbara. Uh, this is, these little nodules and little layers are evidence for microbial mat communities, kind of like the, te the film on your teeth, you know, your plaque, uh, which were dominant, dominated the earth uh, for 90% of its history. There's late shore stromatolite 2.7 billion years old. So from 3.5 to 2.7, there's stromatolites alive in the uh, Shark Bay in Australia now. So there, and you can actually take a bus trip back 3.5 billion years from just north of Perth up into the northwest to the oldest, largest piece of Archean crust and, and, and trace your ancestry. It's a fantastic place to go. So we think that this is what the volcanic island would have looked like for the origin of life. Uh, this is a depiction done by Ryan Norcus, complete with camera scatter. Uh, but what happens is there's a, there's a volcano in the distance, there's water, hot water blasted out, it flows into a pool, kind of like you'd see at Yellowstone, and it fills the pool. And when it fills the pool, it, it creates a pulse of hot water, and all those reagents which are coming in from meteorites in space, all that good organic is coming in uh, from delivery, like almost like a snow, and especially in this time period. It concentrates in the pool as it dries down and forms a bathtub ring around the edge of the ponds. And you can still see this today. In that bathtub ring is where the chemistry of life can begin. So we'll take a look at it. So here's a landscape. Stuff is coming in from space. It's concentrating in just the right, what we call the Goldilocks chemistry. The pool is just right, you know, for Goldilocks' porridge. This is the porridge theory of the origin of life. Uh, and it gets into the right pool and through time cycles in the pool and then can adapt. When life begins, it can adapt to elsewhere on the landscape. And it turns out the ocean shore is a really tough place. It's all salty and full of massive tides and storms. Tough place for life, actually. So you collect, you concentrate all this beautiful almost like spermatozoa or agatozoa delivered to you from space in this dusty disk of the early solar system, concentrating in these pools, feeding these pools, and then the pools are the heartbeat. They're the cycle that brings life into existence. So this is more chemistry gobbledygook, but this is our first simulator that we built at UCSC, which rotates little dishes around and hydrates and dehydrates the dishes. So we're simulating that hot spring action. And in between, 
uh, in the dishes we put something like almost soap, but it's called lipid. It's what you're made out of. It's what your cell walls are made out of. And it all floats together into these bathtub ring membranes, squeezes the little building blocks of you together and zips, zippers them together into the polymers of life. And there's some results of, from the, this rotating uh, simulator dish. So we can make what's called RNA, DNA, and other groups have made peptides. And those are the three big, the three big stringy ticker tape things that drive you. Here's me at, at Yellowstone uh, last year where we put our reagents directly into uh, the pools at Yellowstone. You need a permit for this, by the way. You don't want to fall in, buffalo fall into these pools. It's not pleasant. Um, but here I am with, uh, I've actually made the little protocells, the little pre-cells in Yellowstone water. And when we put them under a microscope, we saw them here. When we dried them down, they could actually encapsulate DNA. But over there, we tried it with seawater, and they turned to crystals. Because if you try to wash your hands in seawater, the soap grows to curds, right? You can't do it. So you can't form the little compartments you need for the first protocells. And this is New Zealand, which you just saw. There's my little dish surrounded by spa towels. <laughs> there was a spa connected to the hot spring. And there's the little bathtub ring, the little films that made, those, made that polymer on my phone. And there's our, that's what we normally show our colleagues, these smudges, right? And they, they get excited about smudges, but it's less <laughs> exciting for you than a little stringy thing. <laughs> yeah, gel chromatography. So what do you do with all this? Well, you put it all together, it makes an engine, an engine of creation. Because if you can make these polymers at random and get them inside these little bubbles, you can cycle them like a roulette wheel. They're like chips on a roulette wheel. It's a really simple metaphor. And if, our, if you're a computer geek, are you all, have you been assimilated? <laughs> We've all been assimilated. I, back in 1981, when I was working, first starting in computing, I was the weird kid, right? <laughs> you remember this. <laughs> we were the weird kids, and now we, you know, we were the, the or weird kids. <laughs> so actually, here's a way to think about the origin of life that's really simple, that's nerdy and, and understandable by us which is those polymers are like paper tapes and the old style of, of computers that Bill started with uh, actually had programs on punched paper tapes that loaded into a reader, went into the primitive homebrew computer, this is from my collection, it's called an Altair, and the computer cycled with energy, could run a random tape, this is perhaps how Woz wrote the first programs, was random paper tapes, certainly how Bill Gates would have. And sometimes the programs would run, and sometimes they would not. You could write programs this way, and maybe you had a little simple criteria that if the program ran and lit up one light, you would recycle it and attach it to other random programs. So now the program A ran, lit up a light to say, we chose that. We attach it to program B, C, and D, and AC makes a better computer. And program ACF makes a laptop. This is after trillions and trillions of tries, right? And program ACI makes your cell phone. And this is very inefficient, but you could start with a simple set of rules and a random puncher and evolve computer programs. You could do it. Uh, these days we pay engineers, some people call engineers, to do it slightly more efficiently. <laughs> so the evolution of software and hardware together. So we just said, look, where do we find this system in nature? You find it. The puncher, the random punch paper tape puncher is your polymerizer, which I just showed you. The, the paper tapes are the polymers. The computer is the warm little cycling pond with our Charles Darwin. The programs are protocells, and they either pop or they do not. That's natural selection. That's the criteria. And this can drive the evolution of software and hardware together with no creator needed to be around there, not even Charles Darwin. And here's our machine, here's our engine of creation. It goes through dry with the films, wet with things getting encapsulated, testing, do they pop or do they not, and interacting when they come down and snuggle together at the bottom of the pool. And here's what they all look like under the microscope. This is all working now, this whole system. And we get more and more of these little sludges. That's called the progenote. That's something Carl Woese named in the 1970s as the boot up phase of life. 
I talked to his graduate student who was the co-author of that paper, and he said, I think you guys have found the path to the progenome. Pretty exciting. So this is, for chemists, it's called a kinetic trap. Polymers can cycle and get more complex, like Charlie Darwin said, a, a protein compound shall form and get more, more complex. We found it, we found the kinetic trap. So here it all, all put together, this is a poster we took two years to develop that Scientific American used. You start out with your synthesis of your polymers and your, or your building blocks in your dusty disk, which we see through Kepler now. We see these disks of early solar systems. They fall on land like a snow. They get into these little pools. They get concentrated. The concentration forms all kinds of things like membranes and, and organics. They find themselves into the ideal cycling pool that's just, just doing its little engine, driven by the hot spring, driven by day-night cycling. The progenote emerges. It's a, a robust little set of sludge. It's actually a community. It's a primitive cellular community. It floats into other pools and other streams where it has to learn how to eat sunlight. So it does some kind of early uh, pigment capture. Then somewhere along this, this way, the community action and the network supports the invention of cell division, which is then the transition to cellular life. And then you get a much more robust genetic system uh, that allows your life to go and adapt to tougher environments like the estuaries and seashores and to colonize the planet and leave down these stromatolites as evidence. So we found, in a sense, we propose that we found the origin of life is the origin of the microbial community, not individual cells. There couldn't have been a cell at the tree, uh, a single cell at the, the tap root of life. It was a community function. Think about that. Think how that rolls into philosophy. So we're working on the roots of the tree of life. Here's what Scientific American did last year. They put it on the cover during the eclipse. Uh, where Paul and I were at the Eclipse Festival and we, we bumped, uh, they bumped the Eclipse off because the editor is a microbiologist. <laughs> so that was cool. So I then went into thought experiment mode and I thought, well, this isn't just a chemical model for the origin of life. This is something more profound. This is the transition from physics into biology. There's, there's some amazing process that, is, that drives that actual empirical cycle that we might be able to apply to uh, ourselves and to the explanation of reality. So I said, what is the transition? What is the thing that lifts biology out, biology out of physics? And I had a dream one night, and the previous speaker was talking about dreams. Uh, this was my dream. I said, I was there in a nice dream state, and I said to the dream, is it necessary to have a guy in a white beard standing around at the origin of life in the cosmos saying, uh, move that carbon atom five angstroms to the left? And the guy was pretty cranky, and he said, no, that's an unnecessary complication. Let me show you how you were made. So I was presented this undulating plane, and, it, and the guy said, push down. I pushed down, and it undulated. He said, that's pre-statable. That's predictable. That's physics. And then suddenly in the plane opened up this little divot. And I realized it's one of my, fa my favorite things, the membranous compartment. And within that compartment were crowded molecules that got trapped in there and moved through the membrane. And I realized, oh, wow, there's something weird going on here. It then showed two compartments next to each other with polymers and stuff going back between membranes. And then it showed a bunch of them together with a network that was growing non-linearly, in fact, exponentially, and asked me, what do I see? I said, well, it seems like if you can crowd things into a space, you increase the probability of, of improbable things happening non-linearly. Oh, crowding together. It's a physical self-assembly thing. If you get a bunch of those compartments, they form an interconnected network where a thing happening in one diffuses over and starts a thing over here, which diffuses over here. It's actually a network effect. Oh, merged through the self-assembly process. And then the, the, the white-bearded whatever it was, asked me, well, what's the third one? You know, here's my third Cartesian plot. What's on that? And I said, uh, some kind of a memory? And it said, bingo. Out of this system, a memory can arise and be uh, written and read. And once you have a memory, you have this. Boom. A probability shaper, which is rolling dice, but things are getting more likely and happening, which drives an inter interaction network, the rise of the network, which drives the rise of a memory system, which, what does it do? 
it has blueprints for the next generation. So it makes things that are improbable even more probable. And it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. And makes everything. So I thought, gee, this is like, is this at the center of everything? And I thought back to Copernicus, who luckily, before his, uh, he published this result that the universe was, was sun-centered, not earth-centered. It was a heliocentric universe after his death, so he didn't lose his head or his funding. So here he is, you know, with this heliocentric universe, and he recentered human thought on a new idea, which was revolutionary, that we were not the center. There was another cosmos, there were other worlds. And I thought, maybe this PIM progenote is a new Copernican type center. What does it explain? It certainly explains the way from equilibrium chemistry going into biology. It explains the entire track into biology, evolutionary biology, how geology was shaped by this system. Because we have like 6,000 6, minerals on Earth and there's only 400 on Mars because we have biology. Uh, it tells you where life can arise in the universe, you know, hence my work with NASA on exoplanets and Mars discovery. It actually even goes down into physics. It shows that physics can self-assemble linear information. And the physicists never thought that was possible in the quantum world. It actually tells us how to be build better AIs, if we use this PIM little triangle thing. How economies work, how political economy works. I showed this all to Ken Wilburn, he loved it. You know, it's like, he says, it spirals all the way down. You found the start point. So you love that, and maybe it's at the root of spiritual tools and spiritual inquiry too. So the question that I asked here last year in presenting this is, is there anything not explainable by this system? And that here we are at SAND, we're crowded together into a room, where then we're gonna have unlikely meetings happening. We're gonna then communicate, and we're gonna make memories. We're recording the session, and then the next time we meet, we evolve our understanding. This is the system, it's still working. Is it an engine of creation that we live inside? So I predict that these properties cycle and generate all perceivable phenomena and all felt experience, if we really look through this lens, all from the origin of life. And that it creates an experiential field, a large field that we only perceive a very small fraction of. So let's take a look at how this unravels. It probably does unravel. Uh, the cosmic cycling, according to our physicists, is a two-phase system. They haven't been able to find anything that isn't just state-changing in physics. It doesn't write, write memories, you know? But when life begins, it creates a memory. So it's a three-phase engine. It's like a, you know, a cheap East German car or something. When neural dynamics get going, then organisms can change and evolve and adapt in their lifetime. That's maybe the fourth phase. When you pack enough of neurons together, maybe we start getting self-awareness. It's a fifth phase. So here we go. Physics of the cosmos, on off, two cycle engine. Life adds the third cycle, it remembers things. Here's the neurons, there's the brains coming. So what if this all is just one system? This is where Ken Wilbur was jumping up and down. <laughs> What if this is on system, but what's the sixth phase that we're talking about here this in experiencing at this conference? It's perhaps, and this has been said on this stage and many others many times, that it's awareness aware of itself. But what are you really aware of? You, if you are a product of this system, this cycling system, you're aware if you're casting your mind back through four billion years, just like we've just done, and you, you can sense where we came from, how we were made, that's the biggest awareness. And where is our place in the cosmos? How our own body systems work seem to map that. The chakras seem to map these levels as well. You get up to here, you get more memory, et cetera, et cetera. And isn't it just that this system is this system? That it actually is one system. And that, say, in a sense, unity consciousness is the deep knowing of our own roots, our own ancestry, and our own evolution, and deep gratitude for it. So I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, you're the first person, people, persons to see that uh, RNA polymer that uh, may end up on the cover of another magazine at some point. But uh, 
Uh, now our colleagues are going to be skeptical of that, and we have to do the, the testing over and over and over again because it's a strong claim, requires strong, very strong evidence. But uh, tomorrow, what I'm going to bring you is the continuation of this story. When we get to the point where uh, humans arise, and I'll show you on the main stage at 3.30 uh, how this same system brought us into being, into consciousness, how it created the brain that could support consciousness, and how evolution did that and patterned us in a most remarkable way that is also uh, a constriction. Uh, it's also a huge challenge to our survival, the very process that brought us into being. And I hope I can shed some light on it. And I'm, I'm an optimist because, frankly, how can you not be an optimist when you consider, and I was just at an exoplanets meeting, because uh, I'm on review panels, and when you, the, the terrible but wonderful news is that Earth is so extraordinarily rare and the conditions that led to us. Think of a trillion rolling of the dice where you had to roll, like you had 10 dice and you had to roll 10, per, 10 perfect sixes every time, you know, a million times in a row to make us. We are so unlikely. We're so breathtakingly unlikely. And as we look out at our own solar system, we see the fate of planets. The fact that our solar system has rocky worlds on the interior is really rare. They're in stable orbits. That We have a wonderful, magnificent protector called Jupiter. It's our sentinel that pulled all that rocky material out so we, did, we weren't a shooting gallery. Then we got a big moon, which is extremely rare, which protects us. We have two protectors. And then we, we got slammed at just the right times to reset our planet for complex life to emerge, which took over three billion years. The little slime, slimy things had to produce the oxygen so we can breathe it. And most worlds, when they form, they may have water on the surface for a while, and then they lose it. So Mars, we now, the, the, the new studies have shown, Mars probably became, uh, its oceans just basically evaporated uh, within a billion years, maybe as, many, as little as 400 million years, large, Mars lost its liquid water. Venus, it went straight into the atmosphere, into this massive greenhouse, you know, hell. So it is really hard for a planet to hold its liquid water at the surface. And for the three billion years before Gaia, before there was a system that could regulate the, the gas content and the temperature of our own atmosphere, life had no chance. It had, the whole Earth froze over into a snowball a couple times. It almost died. Earth almost died many times and almost lost the ability to have liquid water at the surface. It went out of what was called habitability. So it's extremely rare for planets to just happen to keep the liquid water around long enough for the biota to get strong enough to start regulating its own environment. I think most of the planets, the life is extinguished and quickly, uh, or has to go underground into rocks where there's no future. So I think we're extraordinarily rare, um, breathtakingly rare. It's not below it, yeah. <laughs> so of course, you know, uh, I think I'll shut up now because we have about five minutes for questions. Does um, the model require the organic figure to come from outer space, or can they be made from terrestrial material too? That's a very good question. Uh, for many years, the hydrothermal vent hypothesis in the oceans had the basic those building blocks, the nucleobases, nucleotides, uh, amino acids being synthesized de novo. And they've never been able to show it working in, in the lab or certainly not in the environments. And most of the chemists are like, look, this is not plausible because if you, if you formed one little nucleobase or something like that, it would just dissipate into the bulk of the ocean. So the field was stumped. And, and until basically the people who were picking up meteorites all over the world and grinding up their interiors and looking, wait a minute, there was billions of tons of this material falling in from the sky especially during that period, raining down like a snow. So there, it's, a, it's a completely solved, in a sense, it's a solved problem. Like we didn't have to work out the chemistry to make, to make those important building blocks. The hydrothermal system does provide, it provides metals and ions and heat activation energy and cycling. 
So they're, they're participating, uh, but they have to be at an air-water interface. They have to be on land, not in the ocean. Yeah, there's in, in abundance. So what organic material, what I mean by organic is it's made out of carbon. It's not a life thing. So you can point a radio astronomy telescope at a star cloud and see the massive amounts of polycyclic aromatics and things like that that are made in space in abundance. Yeah. I think Bill, Bill, you were next. How do you get from that covering with the biopolymers to consciousness? <laughs> I tried to do it. <laughs> um, I think it's all, it's all the same processes of selection. And I think we, I, it's, it's almost beyond the ken of the human brain to grok it. But I think we, we don't have to have seen the whole thing in order to see the patterns. So I think if you make a system big enough and complex enough, and this is where I, I have strong agreement with a lot of uh, the people here, there's a larger, what you might call etheric field, that this thing is made from that process. Didn't, it didn't, I don't think it came from the cosmos. I, a simple structure of polycyclics between stars are not a complex substrate to support a sort of conscious field, but this system is. The system you're in, the living world, Gaia is massive. And the interconnects, I mean, just mycelial connections in the forest. And we're now discovering energetic connections between people that we're just unveiling, we're unrolling that system that works and non-locally and things like this. So, you know, in the psychedelic space, we see amazing stuff. So there's a field, I think, that is made, and, and here's my prediction. It's entirely based on probability. So when you think about that spiral going up, make, taking highly improbable things and making them happen, all the way up to the smartphone, which a smartphone in the history of the cosmos is so improbable, right? Life made it. But we are on a stack of potentiated probability way up here. And I think being on a probabilistic stack so far away from equilibrium of the cosmos means something, and we have yet to discover that. But I think that the, the field, and it's just a simple model, we are, we are just, uh, well, I'll give you an example. Smartphones are this PIM system. They, they crowd things together inside the body of the phone in the data store. They create interconnections, and they have a memory. So they are one of these PIM engines of creation. Guess what's happening? A nonlinear increase in improbable events are happening throughout the human world and probably throughout the entire biosphere because of the introduction of this new system. So you think, how could that be happening? How could that synchronous thing be happening and this be happening? Well, it's totally explainable. We just built a new layer that is making miraculous things come into being. And all religions and all spiritual thought talk about miracles. Well, this is a mechanistic explanation for how miracles are made. That's real simple, and we're carrying it in our pockets. We are it. Our brains are, are based on this principle. It's like one of the things they call toe, a theory of everything, that usually get, you know, get gloss, tossed out, but the theory of everything. So. You think I think consciousness is, is a product of the living world. And that if we look elsewhere, if we say, oh no, consciousness is universal and everything, we're actually denying life. We're taking our attention and saying, consciousness, it's like everywhere and et cetera, et cetera. And we're taking our eye away from the miracle of not only our bodies, but the natural world. Like, no, it's made by life. It's a gift from life. And if, if we lose our, if we take our focus away from life, we're, we're cutting off our, our, not only our heritage, but our survivability. It's, I think in a sense, I'm, all this work for the origin of life, what I'm hoping is that a philosophical outcome is that people just are just in awe of what life is and what life was able to do with its cycling system, with that star rising every day and setting. That was the sole driver of this whole thing. That sun rising in the morning is the sole driver. It's like spinning the Dorjas. Every Dorja is, is totally tied to that. And if you took the Earth out of solar orbit, all of this would crash like almost instantaneously. It's totally exquisitely dependent on the rising of that sun in the morning and its setting. There's a question in the green. 
You're, you're, you're partially green. No, 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 uh, this fellow here. No idea, that, that's probably your department. <laughs> no idea. Uh, further back? Yeah, okay, so uh, if impossibility can build impossibility, and eventually impossibility can become improbable, I mean, probable, um, how come we don't see more life in the universe? For like, so far, what we know, the only conscious entity? I think I, it goes back to the sheer numbers. Like, with Kepler, we have. 1,600 exosolar systems now, and we look at them, and we're only we're not only able to detect like two X Earth planets. We look at it and we go, whoa, we're rare. It's just a rolling of those dice. We are a really rare combination, and 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 space is separated by vast amounts. So there's, there's a lot there's a lot that is a barrier to the emergence of complex life, and so it actually should give us more reverence for the life we have. I think. And question in the front. How does subatomic physics and quantum fit into your model? It does in that subatomic physics fits into the model in that it's driving chemistry and geology and the physics of the world. It doesn't really factor in very much in the beginning. The self-assembly of membranes, perhaps, van der Waals forces. Uh, later on, you get polycyclics acting as pigments, so you get a kind of almost a quantum effect. Eventually, life learns, or through evolution, to harness uh, quantum effects like chlorophyll. It, it, it manages to, to harness that, but you don't really need it in the beginning. It, these are all large scale phenomena. Uh, Chris? I, with respect to this question, uh, if you look at the formalism of your formalism of classical theory, then the one thing that you have to somehow or other is actually never. Yeah. Um, so this this idea of, of memory being essential, I think that memory is even essential to if you will create classicality, even relative classicality. And what we're working on now <laughs> So in the Biota Institute, which we're standing up right now at UC Santa Cruz, the next phase is going to be in the laboratory and in the field, cycling trillions of protocells with the right kind of starting ingredients and see if we get a template polymer emerge. And maybe within two, three generations, it'll win somebody a Nobel Prize for sure. We will see the de novo emergence of a templating system, because you, you can almost build it with synthetic biology now, but we want to see it come out of the background and now we have a templating-based memory system. And what we will do is we'll see a huge surge in, in polymeric product that will come up. And we'll be pipetting these and using our nanopore sequencer to do that. So we'll actually, to actually show the de novo emergence of the first memory system uh, would be a major, a major breakthrough for the field. I think we're, we're out of time. And I think we're out of time.